I'm Dave Hart. I'm the preacher for the Winslow, Arizona Church of Christ. And if you're ever by Arizona in Winslow, we really hope that you'd stop and worship with us if you're able to or come to one of our Bible studies that we have. We'd really love to see you and we would enjoy that very much. Today we're going to look at a sermon entitled, entitled, What Should a Christian Do? What Should a Christian Do? And of course, if we were going to talk about everything that a Christian should do, it would be a very long sermon, wouldn't it? So we always have to narrow these kind of topics down or have multiple sermons on them, but but I've, I've narrowed the topic down to look at some the important things, not that all the things that we're supposed to do isn't important, but some of the important things that a Christian is to do. Because sometimes when somebody becomes a Christian, they don't really understand what all that entails, what all that's about. And sometimes even somebody's been a Christian for a long time, don't understand some of the things that we're supposed to do as a Christian, or, or we forgot those things, or we need to be reminded of them again. So there again, we're just going to to um, cover a few of the many things that a Christian is to do, um, but they are some of the the very important things that a Christian is to do. So let's start out with a very familiar passage: Galatians five twenty two through twenty five. Galatians five twenty two through twenty five. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, also such, I'm sorry, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And we're going to talk more about walking in the Spirit in a little bit. In fact, I kind of want to go over these fruits, these fruits that we are supposed to bear. We're, we're, as Christians, we are to produce something. You know, if you have a good fruit tree, it produces um, good fruit. And some trees is just amazing. We have a lady here in church. And she has an apricot tree, and, and this tree is huge. And, and when it comes to producing, at least most years, some years are different than others, most years, there is just, it, it's incredible how much that one tree, how many apricots it can produce. And that's what we want to do as Christians. We want to produce, we want to produce things, and the Lord tells us some things to produce here. So, Let's go over some of these. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We're to love. We're to love God. We are to love the church. We're to love the Bible. We're to love our fellow Christians. And we're to love mankind. And I understand that man in, in general is, is an evil being. They, they, they choose to do evils, especially in the world. But we're still supposed to love their souls. We're supposed to love their souls. We don't love their deeds. Of course not. Not if they're evil. We don't ever love evil deeds. And and, and it's a hard concept for some people to understand that we are to love all people, but we're to hate sin, including in our own lives. So if there's a person that we know that's leading a sinful life, we're to hate that sin. We're not to approve of that. We're not to condone it. But we're to love the person. We're to love the person. And love God, of course. Joy. Christians should have an incredible amount of joy. And some people will ask, well, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Well, happiness is something that comes and goes. There's nobody in their right mind, anyway, that is happy all the time. There's just too much stuff in this life, too much pain and suffering and death and loss. To be happy all the time. So so happiness comes and goes. Happiness comes and goes. Joy is something that's much deeper because even in the midst of terrible, terrible situations, we can still have joy because we know we have the Lord. We know we have heaven. We know we have his church. And, and, and we have other our Christian brothers and sisters. So... So we can have joy even in the midst of pain, and and Christians should be joyous people. We shouldn't be like Christians are often portrayed on TVs and movies and books and things, that they're just sad-faced and angry and and, and, and no fun and bitter. No, no, you know, I mean, 
Even Christians go through those type of things at times, don't they, depending on circumstances. But, but the, the, normal, the normal attitude of a Christian should be one of overwhelming joy. We should be people that other people like and want to be around, that we are friendly, that we, that we um, accept people. We don't accept the sin. We don't accept the sin. We don't condone the sin. But, but we're accepting of people to try and bring them to the Lord if possible. So, so a, a Christian should bear a, the fruit of joy, over, overwhelming joy in their life. That's another fruit we're to bear is peace. We're to be peaceful people. We're to be peaceful people. Oh, does that mean that we can't defend ourselves if we need to? No, it doesn't mean that. But in general, we should be peaceful people who seek peace, who try and do everything within their power to cause peace in the world and peace between people. And just think if everybody in the world was a Christian, just think if everybody in America was a Christian, everybody in your town was a Christian, how much more peace we'd have. And you might say, well, sometimes there's not peace in the church because people argue and stuff. And that's sad, and unless it's standing up against false teaching, and that should not be. And people are, are weak at times. But in general, in general, um, the, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace. It's a peaceful kingdom. And we need to do all that we can to have peace in our lives, peace in our families, peace in the church, and, and be at peace with others as much as it is up to us. And then the next fruit we're going to look at, this one can be a hard one. Ooh, it can be a hard one. Long suffering. Long suffering. What does that mean? It means you suffer long, a long time, a long time. And it can mean a lot of things in our lives. It can mean personal things, health things, relationship things, all kinds of things like that. It can also mean that we suffer along with other people. Maybe there's somebody, for instance, that you're trying to bring to Christ and it takes a long time. You ever had somebody? Oh, I've had people. It's taken a long, long, long time. I've even known people that I've worked with for years to try and bring them to Christ. Years and years and years. And, and um, uh, there was a couple of people come to my mind from the last church that I worked at, and that's been pretty close to over 20 years ago now. And uh, I can think of two people in there that I really, you know, I really, really cared about. And it, one of them especially I spent a lot of time with and was in Bible studies and Bible studies that I had for years. And both these people I'm thinking of, they were, they, they came to the Lord's church. They came to the church of Christ, but they, um, uh, they were not members of the church. They had married people who were members, and that's the reason they came. So I worked with these people and worked and worked and worked, and, and one was a younger girl, and the other one was an older man. And after I left and came to work here in Winslow, they got another minister, and, and um, uh, the older man finally came to the Lord, finally came to the Lord. And, and the younger lady, it took years longer after I left, it took years longer. And, and finally, um, um, uh, one night, they had a meeting. They had a minister come in for a meeting. And, and uh, this lady, it was a really hard thing for her to do because her family had been Catholics, and they'd been Catholics all their lives. And, and um, it, it was really hard for her to leave that. But after hearing that sermon, and I have to believe all the years that she'd been coming to the church and the Bible studies and lessons and worship and all the friendships and everything combined, she, on the way home from that meeting, decided that she wanted to be baptized. And her husband was thrilled, of course, and they stopped. There was a, a fountain. There was a fountain, public fountain. Um, and he took her right then. And, and um, he, he, he told me the story. There was duck poop that they had to step through and everything else to get to this fountain. But he, but he took her at that very hour and baptized her. 
but it was some long, sorry, it was a long time. And sometimes we got to work very long with people, very long with people. I had one lady that I worked with that um, she always had a lot of questions. Sometimes you get people that just want to ask questions, you know. It, it can be difficult because you kind of set up a Bible study with them and you have your agenda and you, you, you know, you're hoping to teach them certain things and steer them a certain way. And they just want to ask all these questions, all these questions, you know. Well, what about the dinosaurs? And what about, you know, all these different things? And anyway, this lady, she asked me like basically the same questions every week. And I kind of have to put, put my agenda aside because she, she just really wanted to know the answers of these questions. And, and, and like I said, it was, a lot of it was going over the same thing every week, every week, explaining it to her again. And, and uh, she had a heavy influence from, from some Pentecostalism. And, and, you know, she was really into the, you know, why, why are there not miracles now? Why do you say there's not miracles and talking in tongues? And, and every week we'd have to kind of go back over this again. And yes, it was frustrating, but this is where that long suffering comes in at. That, um, that we got to realize that life is not like a sitcom and TV, you know, a sitcom and TV where you, where you, you know, 30 minutes long and basically you got to, you know, everything's okay at the beginning and then you got a problem through the middle of it and then the end of it, everything is great and wonderful again. Life's not always like that, unfortunately. Sometimes, sometimes struggles and issues and things last a long time. So, so one of the fruits we have to bear is long suffering. Kindness, we're to be kind people. We're to be kind people, and that's important for us to understand because the world is certainly a harsh place and we come across rude people and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of rare to come across kind people, to be honest with you. But Christians are to be kind. And, and remember, the, all these things are fruit that we need to bear and we need to keep bearing and bear them, bear them even more as we grow in Christ. So. So we need to be kind. We need to realize that everybody is struggling. Everybody's struggling. Oh, sometimes more than others, but everybody's dealing with something. And sometimes it can be hard to be kind when you're dealing with your own things and, and issues and all that kind of stuff. And you can be cranky. And, but, but we have to strive to be kind people. We, uh, even when Jesus was being harsh with people, it was still kindness to get them to open their eyes and to see the truth and to change their ways. So we need to be kind people. Goodness. We need to, one of the fruits we need to bear is goodness. We, we need to be good people who do good things. We need to be the good guys. I grew up watching a lot of westerns, a lot of John Wayne movies, that type of thing. And, you know, in those old westerns, you could always tell the good guys and the bad guys because the bad guys wore the black hats and the good guys wore the, the white hats, right? So, so we need to be people who do good things to help people, to care about people, to love people, and, and, and to strive to do what we need to do to bring people to the Lord. The next fruit that it speaks of here is faithfulness. Faithfulness. We need to be faithful. And of course, we need to be faithful to the Lord 100%. We need to be faithful to his church. Listen, I have seen so many people over the years that sometimes they've been faithful to the Lord in this church for a long time. And then they just they just walk away for some reason. And it could be many different things. Sometimes they have a fight with somebody in the church. Um, uh, sometimes maybe they move to a new location. They don't get connected or they don't like that particular church as much as their old church. Even sometimes when a minister leaves, you know, they get preacheritis, you know, and the new minister comes in and he isn't the same as the old minister. And in fact, I've always heard of, I, I, I've never um, had to deal with this yet. 
When I came here to Winslow, they had actually been without a minister. I think they said five, seven years before I, I came here. But um, they say that it's really hard when you minister goes to a location where they've had a minister there for many, many years. And he has retired or moved on or died or something. And then you come in and they're so used to that, the, the, the minister they had for all those years that they say most ministers don't last very long in that situation. And, and it's usually the minister after that minister that maybe does a little bit better. That we've got to be faithful, we've got to be faithful to the Lord's church. Uh, one of the big reasons that I see people leave both older people and especially newer people is because sometimes of the friendships and connections and romantic relationships they have. They get connected with people outside of the church and pulls them away. Oh, I, and I see that with the young people so much. It's so painful to see and hear about. So many of the young people get pulled away because of that. But, but we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful to the Lord. We need to be faithful to the Bible. We need to be faithful to the church, to the, to the people in the church, to the cause of Christ. We need to be faithful in our evangelism. Faithfulness is so very important and it is one of the wonderful fruits that we must bear as Christians. Gentleness. We need to be gentle people. There again, everybody is struggling. Everybody has their fights going on. You don't know what's going on in another person's life. Some people are more open about it and can tell you. Other people are very, very closed about it, but yet they're still going through something that's very difficult. And, and, and we're to be gentle people. We're to care about each other each other who care about people's feelings and that's hard sometimes because I'm kind of a rough and tough guy kind of you know that type of guy and I'm not always good with my own feelings let alone somebody else's feelings and I've had to really try to pull back at times and think about okay this person is hurting what do I need to tell them to do and it may not be to you know stop being a baby and get on with it that 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 doesn't work with some people. Sometimes we've got to be gentle with them. Self-control. Oh, boy, people lack self-control in this life. We, we see it in all kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. And, and, and I'm going to touch probably on a sore subject for a lot of us. What about our diets? Oh, you know, me and my wife right now, we're, we're trying to... to um, be strict with our diets after a lot of years of not being so strict and it's hard and giving up things is really hard but but for our, our health we're, we're trying to do it and it's really hard it's really hard you know we can see that in America how many obese people that are out there even young children I see the the, the young children and the teenagers and, and um, how much heavier they are than when I was young um, and, and that's something that's hard to control. You know, it's so easy to go to McDonald's and I like donuts and cake and all those things that I've decided to give up forever and it's hard. But do we have to be as Christian self-controlled people? And that goes for all kinds of things as far as our anger, as far as things that we're going to do or not do. We have to, what, what does self-control mean? It means to control yourself. To control yourself, don't let your lust, your passions, your desires, your emotions control you. You control yourself, your mind, you let your mind control yourself. And, and of course, if we don't do that, us Christians can get ourselves into a lot of trouble, just as people in the world can. So we need to be people who practice self-control. The text says, against such there is no law. There is no law against these things. In other words, in other words, these are all things that a Christian is to do. And verse 24 says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Oh, that's hard. That's hard. That's hard because, you know, I'll, I'll tell people, I say when, you bat, when you're baptized, it, it's a death. It's a death. It's a death and burial. And the old man dies. But... We drag that old, dirty corpse around with us and resurrect it at times, don't we? So the Lord says that, that we have to crucify, we have to kill 
the flesh, and he's talking here about fleshly things, ungodly things, wrong things, and and um, and, the, and the passions and desires that go along with it. And that's something that, that I wish we could just do once, but we have to fight against it all the time. And the times that we do resurrect that old man, we have to put it back to death once again. So, so we must bear fruit as a Christian. We must bear the fruit of the Spirit. Bible tells us that we must also be a wise person, a wise person. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So we have to go beyond knowledge and to wisdom. And what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Well, it starts with knowledge. You've got to know knowledge before you, you, you have wisdom. So it starts with knowledge, it starts with knowing. And, and I'll tell you the difference here. You can read the Bible. You can know the Bible. You can repeat everything in the Bible. But that doesn't mean you follow it. That doesn't mean you follow it. So it starts with knowledge. We've got to have the knowledge. But then it goes into wisdom, which is applying that knowledge. Applying that knowledge in the right way. So when we read the Bible, it's just not to know the Bible, as important as that is, and as much as it has to start there, we have to know the Bible, but then we have to apply it. We have to apply it. So Christians should all be wise people. Why? Because there again, we we should know what the Bible is, says, and then we should know how to apply it to our lives but also to help others when they come with questions. Oh, how many people make so many mistakes because they get the wrong advice? They get the wrong advice. You know, and and we can think about all kinds of things, drugs, you know, alcohol, cigarettes. It's a funny thing about sin because a lot of sin, a lot of sin that we do, we do it because we got some wrong advice. Oh, here, try this. When I was a young person, you know, they wanted me to try this and they wanted me to try that. And I remember the first time that I chewed tobacco, it was, I believe, in the third grade. And and several of the boys, you know, were chewing tobacco and it seemed like, oh, the macho thing to do. And, and, and you know, the, and I wanted to try it. And finally they gave me some and and, um, you know, same thing with puffing on a cigarette or any of those things. I, I had some older relatives that wanted to put alcohol. They wanted me to drink alcohol. They were giving me some bad advice. Bad advice. As Christians, we need to give people good advice. We need to be wise. When people come to us, it should be because they seek our wisdom. Because our wisdom comes from the Bible. Over the years, over the years, I used to call the one of the, the, the head people at World Video Bible School. I don't know how many times over the years. I mean, not all the time, but but you know, several times over the years, I'd call and I want to talk to the to the guy who kind of overseed the whole thing at World Video Bible School. Why? Because I considered him a very wise. Man, and I appreciate it, his wisdom. And he helped me out at times immensely. And he's passed on now. And, 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 and though I've never met him in person, I miss him. He was a wise man who gave wise advice because his advice came from the Bible and years and years and years of study and growing in knowledge and wisdom. So one of the things that a Christian should do and should be is a wise person. And the way we become wise is by studying the Bible, knowing the Bible, and knowing how to apply the Bible both in our life and in the lives of others who may come to us for advice and wisdom. Another thing that we must do as a Christian is we must love God and keep his commandments. All this is so basic and 
and, and, and everything actually starts with this, doesn't it? Everything kind of starts with this. And if we get this part down, we're going to get all the other parts right. So 1 John 5, verse 3. 1 John 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So we must keep what he says to do. And, and, and you know, I... Um, Years ago, I looked at this passage, and I seen where it says his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not a burden, but but sometimes in life it seems like they are. Oh, don't lie. Well, I could lie a little bit and get out of this situation. Or sometimes they seem like they're a burden, but they're not because when we disobey God's commandments, that always becomes a burden on us one way or another. That always becomes a burden on us. So we make our lives much simpler and much easier. And of course, uh, we, we make them in line with God's will and God's ways and God's word when we obey his commandments. And we're not to second guess his commandments. We're not to think that we know better than God does. Oh, I know so many people out there that think they know better than God. Well, you know, we don't have enough people in this church, so let's do this and let's do that. Now, there's a lot of things we can do to get more people that, that is fine, and we should be doing those things. But when we add or change things, when we, when we want to change the worship from what the worship is in Scripture to something that's not scriptural, for instance, adding the instrument, just because we think we might get more numbers, which, by the way, usually... It's the opposite. Usually more people leave the church than you get in new. Um, that's not obeying the commandments of God. When God says something, we're just to do it. It's like if you're a soldier. And, and I, I remember hearing a story about Alexander the Great that, that he brought his army up to this castle that was on a hillside. And the people in this castle, they thought, oh, there's no way he can get in here. Our castle was so strong. And so Alexander told a certain amount of his troops to march towards the cliff. And those soldiers marched. They went right off the cliff. And right after that, the, the, the people in the castle opened up their gates because they realized that um, an army that's that dedicated to their leader and would do whatever he said, that eventually they were going to get in and probably a lot of them were going to die in that process. If the Lord tells you to walk off that cliff, you do it. He's not telling you to do that, of course, but if he did, if he did, we're not to second guess his commandments, we're just to obey Sometimes they may not make sense to you. Sometimes it may be extremely difficult and, and, and cause great hardship in your life. But remember, it's going to be even harder if you don't do them. We just have to obey what he says. And we have to keep those commandments. We have to strive to keep all the commandments. None of us would do it perfect. If we could do it perfect, we wouldn't need the precious, precious blood of Jesus. But we can't do it perfectly, but we need to strive to be as perfect as we can. And then, and then we repent when we fall short and fail and, and get back up and start walking in the light again. So we need to, to, to obey the commandments. We need to know what the commandments are. It's sad because a lot of people in this world today have no idea, not even, not even the Old Testament Ten Commandments. We're not under them, by the way, but... But, you know, the Ten Commandments are very famous, and a lot of, a lot of people don't know them. A lot of young people. We have, listen, we, we work with the young people here. We have the outreach to the Native Americans and, and, and um, uh, you know, people from Mexico. You know, all kinds of people. And we bring the kids in. And these kids, they have no idea, even the basic Bible questions, you know, who's Jesus' mother? Who was the first man? Who was the first? They don't know. And it's so wonderful. You know, we, 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 we have our, um, finally after COVID, we have our, our Bible and science classes going again. And we had some kids like that. Didn't know anything about the Bible. One of the questions I'd ask them is, what is the book called that we know about God in? 
and they didn't know it was the Bible. And, uh, and in a few weeks' time, they've went from that to being able to answer hundreds of, of simple questions. Now we got to go beyond that. They got to understand, you know, more about the story and all that. But but they're learning about the Bible. They're learning to answer Bible questions. They're, they're learning who the first man was, who the first woman was. They, they're learning about the garden. Boy, none of them knew the Garden of Eden. And, and as they were learning this, and I'd ask, what garden uh, did Adam and Eve live in? And boy, they, they I got all kinds of different names and. And um, uh, but but now they, uh, I think they all can answer that one. So we got to know the Bible to know the commandments, and then, as I said, we got to use wisdom and obey those commandments. Obey those commandments. We must do what the Bible says to do. James one verse twenty two: Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourselves. So. There again, I've, I know of people that know the Bible, read the Bible, people who've studied the Bible, but they don't do what it says. They don't obey it. They don't obey it. And, and, and sometimes it's frustrating. You know, I've given sermons, for instance, about how we need to be at the assemblings of the church. That means all the assembly. When the, when, when, when the leaders of the church say this is when the church needs to be here, for Bible study or for worship service, unless a member is providentially not able to come, they are required to come. It is a command of God. And it's frustrating um, because here, like probably a lot of churches out there, we have a morning and evening service, and I think that's important because uh, there's usually people in every church that, at least a few, that... that um, you know, are working or something in the morning and they can't come. So, so the evening's open for them, but it's, it, it is a requirement for everybody to be back. And, and most churches, now here sometimes it's different because we work with the kids and a lot of times we can't get the kids up necessarily to come to morning service. So, so we at times have more in the evening service, but a lot of times in a lot of churches you have maybe twice as many, three times as many in the morning as you do in the evening service. And we had a lady here in the church, and she was in her 90s, a very lovely lady. She never missed anything unless it was something that she providentially wasn't able to come to. And I would, would give a sermon about the importance of coming back on Sunday night. And Sunday night, we just had the basic same crowd, and she came come up to me because they weren't listening, were they? We need to obey the commands. We need to know them, and we need to do what the Bible says. Not just listen, not just hear, not just read, but we need to do it. If, if we don't, we're deceiving ourselves. It's possible to be at every church service your whole life, listen to all those sermons, Listen to all those songs, which teach too, by the way. They, they, they better, or, or we need to stop singing it. It's possible to, to, to be at every Bible study that the church offers. Hear all that information, get that knowledge, and not do what it says. Not do what it says. So, when you hear a sermon... You need to listen. You need to take things away from it. You need to study your Bible for yourself to be sure that sermon's correct. And then you need to obey what it says. And you need to study your Bibles on your own, as families, in, in, in Bible studies. Watch them on, on the internet. You know, we, we live in such a blessed age. You can go on, for instance, YouTube, and you can get thousands of good scholarly sermons from Churches of Christ and World Video Bible School and Heart to Heart, House to House and, and um, uh, Gospel Broadcasting Network and, 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 and many others, many others that are out there. 
And we need to be careful students of the word. Learn what it says and then obey what it says. Another thing that the Bible says that we must do as Christians is we must confess our trespasses to one another and we must pray for one another. James 5 verse 16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So people have asked me from this passage, does this mean we need to confess everything that we've done to everybody? Do we need to go in front of the church every Sunday and say, yeah, you know, um, this girl would walk by and I had a bad thought and then, and then I got angry with my brother in my mind. And No, it's not saying that. It's saying that, that if you have done something against somebody in the church, if you, maybe you've stole $10 from somebody in the church, you need to go confess your trespasses to them. To them. Um, and, and, and the whole church doesn't need to know. When you come up, when you come up, by the way, when you come up and you confess to the church things that you've done, when it becomes public knowledge, when you've done something that, that enough of the public knows that, it, that it's become common knowledge in the church or outside the church even, and, and, and you need to confess that. I believe the Bible tells us we keep sins as private as, as we're able to do so. What do I mean by that? I mean, there again, if, if I um, had a lustful thought for a woman that walked by and nobody else knew about it, well, that's a sin between me and God, and, and I need to confess that sin to him and repent and get right? Yes. If I did take that $10 from a brother in the church, I need to go to him, but, but it, it doesn't need to go any farther in that. But if I've done something, let's say, um, you know, I get a DUI or something and it's known out there, then I would need to go in front of the church and confess because because that's something that, that, that is known. So we need to confess our trespasses to one another. And, and that can be hard, especially when it's maybe like gossip. Maybe we've gossiped about somebody in the church or someone and and we need to go and, and seek forgiveness for that and and, um, you know, and things of that nature. But the Lord says that we must do this. And it also says to pray for one another. Oh, we need those prayers. Prayers are so powerful. I have a lovely, lovely lady in the church here, and, and she emailed me this last week and told me some um, health problems in her family that she's very, very concerned about. And, and, you know, at the end of telling me about it, she just says, I just believe so much in the power of prayer. She's asking for prayers. And, and, um, and of course, you know, I do too. I think it's so vital that we pray for one another. Pray for your minister. Pray for your elders, your deacon, your song leaders. Pray for your Sunday school teachers. Pray for the children, the team. Pray for everybody in the church. I don't do it every day. But I strive to, to pray for everybody that comes to church here. And then, of course, family and friends and, 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 and different situations and, and all that. We, we need to be people who pray for one another. One of the other things that a Christian must do is we must work on sin. We must work on sin. And, and let's be honest, don't we all struggle with sins, although they may not be the same sins? And some of us would be stronger in one area and weaker than another area. And, and we, we always tend to see other people's sins as worse than ours, don't we? <laughs> but we all have a fight here. We need to remember that's a daily fight. And we need to be careful that we don't sin with our body. You know, we can sin with our body, sexual sins, stealing things, punching somebody, acts of violence, things of that nature. And then the next level is our tongue. Oh, there's so many sins of the tongue. We just talked about gossip, but what about profanity, dirty jokes, um, uh, 
you know, just saying things that we shouldn't say, saying things in a harsh way, uh, all kinds of things, all kinds of sins that we commit with our tongue. And, and listen, sometimes it's hard not to commit sin with our bodies. I mean, sometimes somebody just makes me so mad, I want to slap them. But then that next level gets even harder to control, to control what we say, to be careful of what we say. But then there's a third level of sins, and this is the hardest. The hardest, it goes back to when we talked about self-control, and that's the sins of the mind, the sins of the mind, the things that we think. That we can let our mind drift away. Oh, I, you know, sometimes when we're tired or hungry or, or various things and, and we, we're not keeping control of our mind, it can, it can go to bad places, can it? I know sometimes I'll just like, okay, wake up. What, what are you, why are you thinking about that? That's ungodly. Or sometimes we can, we can have a smile on our face, you know, we can smile on our face, we can think it. I hate this person. I hate this person to death. I wish they would die the whole time. We're smiling at them. The sins of the mind are the hardest ones to control. Uh, but the Bible says we're to have self-control, so we're to, we're to control what our body does. We're con to control what our mouth does. And we control what our mind thinks. And it is a constant fight. It is a war that will never end, never end. And I was talking, uh, I've, I've talked to some older Christians and I'm an older Christian now. And I was saying such things as, as lust, you know, having that desire to look at women in a ungodly way. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking at a woman and saying she's a pretty girl or she's an attractive woman. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm talking about looking at a woman in an ungodly way. And, and uh, I was just telling somebody the other day, I was saying, you know, I thought when I got married, I would never desire to look at another woman. That woman would, would, would be all that I'd ever want to look at. It's not that way. Sorry, ladies. It's not that way. Then I thought, well, when I get older, I won't care. I won't care. I won't look at that anymore. I won't, I won't have that desire. You know, I'll be old still there and I've talked to people who work in nursing homes and these people that that you know are very old and sick and ill and and uh, you know they got to be careful that they don't get pinched by them or or you know and, and grabbed and things of that nature so sin is something we are going to have to fight always don't ever think you got it mastered don't ever think you got it beat Listen, some of the Christians that I've known that have fell the farthest and the hardest have been ones who have told me, oh, I don't sin anymore. I got this covered. I got this. I, that isn't a, an issue anymore. I remember one young man, one young man came to me and he goes, oh, I have no problem with women. I got that covered. I don't have that lust. I don't have that... I don't think it was six months later that he moved in with a girl that he wasn't married to. Don't get prideful when it comes to sin. Realize, realize that all of us struggle. And we've got to be careful of shooting our wounded. There again, we see oftentimes other people's sins or certain sins being special sins, worse than anything else, worse, you know, if, if there again, if you're, if you're the church gossip, are you better than that young man that just got a girl pregnant in the church? I guarantee you a lot of churches would, would, would see the pregnancy issue being a lot worse than the gossip. But is it? Would God see it that way? Just because somebody sins differently than you do, don't think that you're better than they are. The, the thing is, we need, we need to work on our sins, and we need to help people to work on their sins. 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 6 says, 
Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So they're gonna, this is not saying that you're never going to sin, but it's saying that you don't stay in that sin. You don't keep sinning. You don't walk in that sin. You deal with it. You struggle with it. You, you have the Lord come alongside you. Maybe you need some brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside you. But you don't live in that sin anymore. Oh, sometimes we get caught up in things. I've had, you know, a big thing is pornography. A big thing is pornography. I just had a young man write to me the other night about how his parents' generation, that to, to, to look at pornography, you had to... Um, you know, go to a, a shady store and, and buy it in magazine form and, and uh, you know, and that. But now, but now you, can, you can just find it on the Internet quickly, quickly. I, I, I just seen something and I posted it. Uh, I posted a couple of times on ministry pages on Facebook and talked about giving your teenage boy a cell phone. When you give your teenage boys, and I know that... Some of you may not like this, but it's true even if they're Christian teenage boys. Oh, my kid's different. Your kid's not different. You give a kid a cell phone, you give them a computer, a laptop, a tablet, without having it supervised, he's going to be looking at pornography. He's going to be looking at pornography. It's too easy. It's a struggle. It's not just a struggle for kids. It's a struggle for every man out there. Oh, every man struggles. Ministers struggle with it. But we must fight it. We must fight it. We must, we must, um, uh, they're again talking of pornography. I had another young man, I've had, well, actually more than one, had young men say, you know, oh, I just feel so bad because you know, I didn't mean to, but I saw this one picture. This is, how pornography, this is how the devil works. I saw this one picture, and then I wanted to see another picture, and, you know, and then I spent two days looking at porn. We have to fight. We have to fight, and porn, by the way, is, is, is like the number one addiction in America. That, you know, porn actually changes the pleasure centers in your brain. And it can affect you even physically. But it's so overwhelmingly addicting. We must fight sin. We must fight it in our lives. We must help others to fight it in theirs. And that will be something that as Christians we must do as long as we are on this earth. Okay, I talked earlier about how we must walk in the light. So let's look at 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, light is cleansing, right? Light is cleansing. It, it, it actually kills germs, all kinds of things. So we have to walk in the light. We've got to keep walking in the light. Now this goes into what we're just kind of talking about with sin. All of us are going to stumble. All of us are going to get off that road and get into the darkness uh, at some points in our life. And, and when that happens, we got to get back into the light. We got to get back into the light. It's kind of like being in your house and, and, and having the, the, the light go out. You know, there's a room that the light went out and you go into that room and it's dark in there and you can't, you know, get around good and you stumble and it's dangerous in there without the light on and, and you know, and you, and you can stumble and all that. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking about especially at night, you know, when it's dark outside and then it's really dark in that room until you get some light in there. But you can walk out of that room, can't you? You can walk out of that room back into the light. You can see once again and... And, and, and everything's okay. So we need to examine our lives. We need to examine our lives. Are we walking in the light? Are we walking in the light in all areas? Now that could be a tricky one. That could be a tricky one. Uh, there again, uh, we'll go back just a moment for the porno thing. I've known ministers who, who effective ministers, they would preach right, they would teach right. 
they, they would have their life in line with God's wills and God's ways. But they were watching porn. So yeah, for, for the most part, they were walking in the light, but they had that one darkness there that they need to come out of, they need to come away from. Same thing with everything that's sinful in life, drinking and drugs and, and, and so many things, so many things. We've got to examine our lives. And, and sometimes we can say, oh, I'm pretty good. You know, I give a whole bunch of money to church. I'm in a worship service, and the, you know, and that's wonderful. Those things are wonderful. We need to be doing those things. It would be wrong not to do those things. But we need to examine every area of our life. We need to take a flashlight into those dirty, dusty corners that sometimes we don't even like to think about, that we don't want to deal with, that, 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 that are going to be difficult to shine the light on. But that's what we need to do. We need to shine the light of the gospel in every area of our life. Examine every area and be sure that we're walking in that light and, and come out of the darkness if we're not. Shine the light in those dark corners. In those times when we trip and we fall into the darkness, we need to get out of there. Because just like a, a really dark place, you, you know, I, I've, I've talked before about in this, this church building here, that there will be times that maybe I'll come up the back way here and the lights will be off here in the auditorium and I can't see to get from back there to up there. And I'll think I can. I don't anymore because I've just hurt myself too many times. I think I can. I think I know by memory. They go about this far and I'll fill the wall or whatever. So I think I can make it. There's an awful lot of people that think they can make it in the darkness. But every time I will trip or I'll bang into something or, or I'll end up back um, with the stairs back there that goes up to the nursery and, and I'll end up trapped in there and, 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 and almost every time I'll think I'm one place and then I realize I'm not. And it's hard for me to make it from there to the front of the auditorium when it's pitch black in here. And you're not going to make it from here to heaven if it's pitch black in your life and it's dangerous. It's dangerous and the longer you stay in that darkness, the more danger um, it entails. The last thing I want us to look at today, what a Christian should do, is, um, is we must know how to conduct ourselves in the church. We must know how to conduct ourselves in the church. Remember, the church is not the building. The church is the people, right? We're the church. But when God talks of the church, he's talking of us together as a group. When we come together, church, you know, ecclesia in the Bible is the called out and the called to. So we're called out and we're called to be the church. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to know how to conduct ourselves. What are the things that we, we need to do in the church? And um, 1 Timothy 3.15, 1 Timothy 3.15, remember this is Paul telling Timothy, a young preacher, trying to teach him what he needs to do as the minister at the church. Paul says, but if I'm delayed, I write to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So remember, Leviticus in the Old Testament was written to priests, of, of what priests were supposed to do and the law and all that. And 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus in the New Testament is written to preachers and, 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 and leaders in the church to know how they are to do in the church and to conduct things and the law of God and all that. So, what are the things that, that are involved with the church? Oh, there's so much. People don't realize how much. And, and sometimes people have to wear, wear a lot of hats. You know, here... Unfortunately, it's been a long time since we've had elders. When I first came here, we were able to put a couple of elders in. They were wonderful, wonderful men. 
but they've both moved away and unfortunately we haven't been able to put more elders in. So, so I've had to wear a lot of different hats here. And there's an awful lot of people that would just come to church on Sunday and sit in the pews and, and not understand all that's involved with the church, all that's involved. Let's just go through some of the things. There again, not a complete list, but but the worship, we gotta have worship. That that's mandatory for the church. And it has to be done right, and you gotta have leaders for that and and songbooks and you know all, all the various things that go along with worship. Discipline, there has to be discipline in the church. Sometimes people have to be disciplined and, um, and, and even dis- fellowshiped at times. But there has to be di- a discipline. Church has to have outreach. Church doesn't evangelize. It's not really the Lord's church, is it? You've got to have evangelism and, and, um, and uh, you know, ways of doing that and teaching that and encouraging that. A lot of times churches will have special things like we do here, vacation Bible school, gospel meetings, special programs. We've got to have teaching. A church has to teach and has to edify. And, and there's got to be um, Sunday school classes and teachers for those and be sure they have the proper training and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, we've got to have the Bible classes and a lot of times there's materials or various things that go along with that. There needs to be times of fellowshipping when we can get together, maybe have a potluck or things of that nature, when we can fellowship and encourage each other and strengthen each other. Uh, benevolence, a church needs to have a benevolence program. We're to help needy saints and we're to help those outside the church as we have opportunity and resources to and, and in order to do that, there needs to be somebody that, that works on that. Here we have a, a food closet. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of poor people, a lot of people traveling through here that break down and, and they don't have anything to eat. So we try to, try to keep some food for them and somebody has to run that and look over it. Uh, we have to be sure that we have the right church government that, that we're would, would, would doing things the way the Bible wouldn't tell us to do that. Um, not making up our own forms of, of church government. There's all kinds of business things that the church has to deal with. Everything from uh, the government on certain things and inspectors and, and paying the bills for the electricity and the gas and, and all those type of things. Finances. Every church deals with finances. Some churches, that's a real struggle. Um, we hear we, we have people that, that help us from outside. And if some of you are watching this, just know that we always thank you for that. And, and you help us to be able to do what we do here. And you have your part of the work by helping us. Uh, taking care of the office, phone calls, things of that nature. Bookkeeping. Somebody has to keep the books uh, for the church. Cleaning and maintenance. Don't ask them to because God's people takes care of God's things. So we don't ask no members. We don't have pie sales and we don't go into business and stuff like that with the church. Um, another one might be the uh, finances. Somebody has to overlook the finances of the church and have to try and decide, okay, this is, you know, the, the budget that we have, or this is the issues that we have, and this is how much it's coming in, this is how much we need, and do we have enough to do, to do mission work? Do we have enough to do, you know, help a smaller church? Do we have all of these things need to be taken care of, and we need to do them all the way the Bible would tell us to do it. And the Bible is very specific on certain things. And other things, he gives us a lot of leeway that as long as we are not breaking any Bible law or Bible principle, we have a great leeway in how to handle those particular things. But every member should be concerned with the conduct of the church. With the conduct of the church. And by the way, all those things that I talked about and there's other things too, if you're not helping the church in any of those things, why aren't you? Why aren't you? Every church has these and other things that they're dealing with. 
And, and the more you can spread these things out, the more you can help out, the more time you'll give your leaders to do more spiritual things. Sometimes the minister and the elders, they, they get so involved from in taking care of so many different things in the church that they have little to no time on the spiritual things. On the spiritual things. So, so remember that all Christians are part of the church and all Christians should be involved to make the church the best church wherever you're at that it can possibly, possibly be. And how could you, by helping out, maybe some of these things we talked about, help the church to be better, to be better. So there you have the lesson on some of the things that a Christian should be doing. And then, like I said, there's many, many more things. But a Christian life is, is to be a busy life of serving God. And we need to make time for that. Sometimes we get so busy with work and family and hobbies and all that kind of stuff. And, and we know there's a place for those things. But when we have too busy of a life that we don't have time to do the things we need to do as a Christian. We're too busy and we need to re-examine our lives. We need to re-examine our lives to be sure that we're doing the things that a Christian needs and must be doing. If there's any here today watching and you've not put on the Lord in baptism, I'd beg you to please not hesitate, to not wait, to not put that off another day. Get a hold of a Church of Christ in your area. Maybe you're going to a Church of Christ and you haven't done that. Or you're not familiar with the Church of Christ. If, if that's the case, call the Church of Christ. Go by, visit them. Let them know that you're interested in being saved, that you're interested in knowing the Bible. And remember, to be saved, you've got to hear the Word of God. You've got to hear it, you've heard it through this sermon today. You've got to hear it, read it, and then you've got to believe it. You've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. And then the Bible says that we have to repent. We have to turn from our sins, be sorry for our sins, turn away from them. And then we have to confess Jesus is the Son of God, and then we have to be baptized to wash our sins away. At that point, the Lord puts you into his church, and then we must remain faithful unto death. If you haven't done those things, please get a hold of the Church of Christ and talk to them about it. They can show you in the Bible, and they will show you by the Bible, that what I said is what we need to do in order to be saved. So please don't hesitate. Please call the Church of Christ. Go by and visit them this week, today. If you're using this video, maybe you're a shut-in or providentially can't be at worship service this week. Um, please don't forget the other acts of worship to take the Lord's Supper, sing psalms and spiritual songs to the Lord, to have a time of prayer, and to give an offering to the Lord's Church. I want to thank you for watching today. And if you found this video helpful, please share it with others. And I hope that you have a great week, and God bless you.